Thanks very much, John, for that generous introduction. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I spent a year in uh, Louisiana, and I have almost nothing but fond memories of, of your great state, so it's really, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, he mentioned in the introduction that uh, I got appointed to this thing called the Pontifical Academy for Life, and part of that is that you get an audience with the Pope, and if you know about what an audience with the Pope is, there's different kinds of audiences. Uh, there's you, the Pope, and 500 of your closest friends, and you're kind of way out there. But this came with an actual personal audience of the Pope. Like, you get to shake his hand and talk to him for a little bit. So I found out about that, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. What, what am I going to say to the Pope? And uh, I thought, well, you know, I only have, you only have a little bit of time, but I thought, I want to say something very meaningful and something that will maybe start a little conversation. So I thought a long time about it. I thought, okay, what I'll say to him is, um, Holy Father, would you please pray? for my family and my university. And I thought, well, you know, maybe he'll ask me about my family, ask me about my university, we'll have a little conversation or something. So I thought, oh, this is great. Uh, so uh, the big moment arrived. Right? And the person in front of me is shaking hands with the Pope, and they're talking, they're having a great conversation. And then all of a sudden, there it is, my turn. So the Pope's right there. So there he is, the Pope. Got my hand and say, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> That was my big conversation with the Pope. So it <laughs> didn't go exactly as planned, but uh, <laughs> you're right, exactly, exactly. So um, it wasn't ideal, but that's okay. That's okay. It's a great honor, of course. So today I'm going to talk to you about the role of conscience in healthcare. And right now in the United States, there are protections for uh, people of faith and also secular conscientious objectors who, for example, uh, do not want to perform abortions. So in the United States today, uh, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. You're not going to lose your job. You're not going to get fired. You're not going to be kicked out of medicine. It's perfectly fine. It's protected. But there are many people that want to get rid of these protections. There are many people who literally want to make it the case that if you're a person of faith, say a Catholic, or a secular conscientious objector, that you will not be able to practice medicine. And in fact, some of these advocates are so radical that even if you were already a doctor, right? Imagine you've been practicing medicine for 10, 15, 20, even 30 years. You might be mid-50s, late 60s, who knows? Many of these people want to make it the case that you would be forced to perform abortions. And if you said, I'm just not doing that, then you'd be kicked out of medicine. You'd lose your job. You'd have to find a new profession, which isn't that big a deal if you're you know, 22 maybe to find a new profession. But if you're 62, 52, whatever, I mean, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So what I want to do today is I want to look at the reasons that people have given for abolishing conscience protections. In other words, what are the scholarly arguments that various people have given to say we should get rid of conscience protections entirely? Okay? And on my view, these arguments fail. I do not think these arguments are proving their case that we should get rid of conscience protections. But I do want to explore them so that you're aware of the strongest arguments out there in favor of getting rid of these conscience protections. Okay? Does that make sense what I'm going to do? So I'm going to look at a number of different reasons. The reason is I'm going to look at, the first one has to do with an objection from the rights of patients. So the idea of this is that, um, here, I'll quote from one of these scholars, he says, the conscientious belief of a physician may be legitimately halted at the point that it interferes with the rights of patients to access services they are entitled to receive. That interference, however, is precisely what happens each time a conscientious objector is accommodated and the patients are unable to access the required uh, service. So the idea here that this person is saying is, look, you have two different rights that are coming into conflict. Right? You have the right of the patient a legal right, in the United States at least, to, say, get an abortion. And then you have the right of a physician or a nurse to say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to participate in that. And so these two rights come into conflict. And they basically say, hey, the right of the patient to receive this treatment should always trump, that's the key part, always trump the right of the nurse, say, to decline, or the physician to decline to provide this treatment. Okay? Now, it is true that doctors have very serious obligations to their patients. 
That's certainly true. And nurses have very serious obligations to their patients. So no one's denying that. Clearly, if I get into the healthcare profession, I have certain obligations to the people that come from you know, my help. So no one's denying that. But is it the case that the rights of the patients always trump the rights of a healthcare provider, a nurse or a doctor? I think if you think about it, you can see right away that clearly is not true, right? I mean, if that were really true, wouldn't it be the case that, let's say, um, I am a patient of a doctor, so I would really like to receive my health care on Sunday, right? And let's say my health care provider, it, you know, doesn't work on Sunday. You know, I would really like the, the um, doctor to do house calls. It's very inconvenient for me to go drive all the way to the, you know, the, the hospital and wait in line. I want her to come to my house and the nurse to come to my house and take my blood pressure and give me all the things I need. That would be very convenient, right? In fact, if my desires and rights always trump the rights of the healthcare professional, you know what I'd really like? I'd like them to do all this for free. <laughs> hey, wouldn't you? Right? Free healthcare, no copay. I don't want to pay 20 bucks, whatever, nothing. I want you to come to my house. I want you to provide the service for me. I don't want to pay for it. And that's, I mean, if it's really true that the rights and desires of the patient always trump the rights of the healthcare provider, we'd have to completely change medicine. And what would happen then? How many people would go into medicine if that were required? I mean, would you want to be a nurse if any time you know, somebody has a health issue, they can just call on you and you have to sh drive across town, show up at their house, give them whatever they want? I mean, that's insane, right? That's completely unworkable, right? So the fact is, we recognize already in all kinds of situations that the right of the patient does not always trump the rights of the provider, the healthcare professional, the nurse, the doctor, whoever, right? And we have to recognize that because otherwise no one would want to go into medicine. It would be insane. It would be completely crazy. Now, here's something to think about. If you are someone who conscientiously objects to providing some procedure, that is a much more serious thing, right, than simply, oh, I don't want to work on Sundays or something, right? If you think about people who think abortion is wrong, they really, really, I mean, you know, if you gave them the choice, either do abortions or work on Sundays, of course they'd prefer to work on Sundays, right? So it's a much more core belief. So if doctors and nurses are not required to work on Sundays, which they're not, right? As a healthcare provider, you can say, hey, I'd be happy to work six days a week, but one day a week, I want time off, and I want to be with my family. And everyone respects that, and rightly so. It would be crazy to not allow doctors and nurses to have days off. But if we allow that, which is a much more minor thing, well, then it follows we should allow the greater thing, namely the personal integrity of the healthcare provider not to provide, say, objectionable uh, procedures. Okay, so let's take a look at a second argument. And this is a, a consequentialist argument that have, um, let's see here, sorry. Yeah, so this is a um, consequentialist argument that is given in favor of the idea of getting rid of protections for doctors. Um, so here's how this goes. Uh, these scholars who are uh, wanting to change things, they say, um, if you allow conscientious objection, quote, it opens the door to any number of more or less arbitrary and random conscientious objection claims. For policymakers aiming to establish a functioning healthcare system with predictable service delivery and guaranteed service levels to the people who finance the system, this is an insurmountable problem. It's almost impossible to predict which healthcare professional in which part of the system will demand accommodation for what kinds of purported or real convictions. So the idea, in other words, is we can't allow conscientious objection because it leads to chaos, right? You need the healthcare system, so go, says the objectors, to provide services in a predictable, orderly way. But if you allow conscientious objection, it's just gonna be chaotic and you know, you're, you're not gonna know who to go to and which doctors do what, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the objection. All right, now is this a good objection? Is this a good objection? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Because we have, in fact, had conscientious, conscientious objection in the United States for almost 50 years. The laws in the United States, after Roe versus Wade, there were various laws called the Church Amendments, which were passed, which protected conscientious objection. So it's not quite 50 years, but it's almost 50 years of these laws and protections for people of faith and secular people who don't want to, say, perform abortions. Now, is our healthcare system, because of these laws, in utter chaos? 
Is it just crazy and no one knows how to get an abortion? No one knows where to go? It's just utterly unpredictable. No, not at all. In fact, is it not extremely predictable? How many of you here, let me just ask you a question. How many here, you know a person who conscientiously objects to providing asthma medication? Anybody? Right? How many people here know someone who, a nurse, physician, who conscientiously objects to setting a, a broken arm with a cast? Anybody? Right? Okay, okay. How about someone who conscientiously objects to providing antibiotics for a sinus infection? You know some doctors that I can't do that. That violates my conscience. Well, no, right? I mean, I assume. No one's raising their hand, right? No. Of course not. We know already there are only a few procedures, really a handful of things, that some doctors and some nurses don't want to do. This is not a random, chaotic thing. Like, oh my gosh, we just, today it's sinus infections, and tomorrow it's casts, and the next day it's asthma medication, and then eye doctor. That simply is not the case. And we've been doing this for, again, since 1973. Right? 1973. That is a long time. And the fact is, we don't have chaos in our healthcare system. It's not as if there's this unpredictability and all this stuff. So that's just not going to work. That's just not going to work. Um, another similar sort of objection they raise is the following. Um, it says, respect for private conscience choices will result in avoidable suboptimal access to health care. Right? The idea, in other words, is that if you you know, allow doctors, nurses, not to provide abortions, that people basically are, are not going to be able to get them. Now, is that true? Right? Is that empirically true? In the United States, for instance, it, is it the case that if someone wants to get an abortion, it's impossible to find? I don't think so, right? I mean, in fact, in the United States, each year, the number varies. So the number in the United States of abortions that are performed each year varies. It depends on the, on the year. But basically, in the 80s, it was about 1.5 million each year. That's about the size of the city of Seattle. Right? That's a big number. That's not like some unknown, impossible to get thing. Now the numbers of abortions uh, are much lower. So it's about 900,000. Right? And there's a dispute, you guys may know, about why that's taking place. Um, I actually think the reason it's taking place is this little thing I have in my pocket. No, honestly, I think it's true. I think it's, it's phones and, and, and electronics. So you have many young people who, who you know, are not going on dates even, not getting their licenses, not doing many things that people used to do back in the day because they're you know, on their phone all the time. Right? So in any case, the number is now about 900,000. So what that means is that abortion is actually one of the most common medical procedures in the entire country. So the idea that somehow protecting the conscience rights of a nurse or a doctor is going to make abortion impossible, no one will be able to get it, that's very hard to reconcile with the fact that abortion is one of the most common procedures in the United States. Right? If it's so hard to get, you'd think oh, well, you know, there'd be almost none of them, but there's enormous numbers every year. Okay. Um, another objection that uh, is important to consider, too, is how this affects the individual. Now, I want to talk about a concrete case. Let's imagine uh, the city of Los Angeles where I live. And I have a, uh, imagine a doctor, um, Okina Kenzua, right? She comes from Nigeria. And because she is an immigrant from another country, she's made a special mission to try to reach out to Muslim women from Nigeria. And you can imagine this taking place, right? That they feel comfortable with her, speak the same language, she's able to understand their situation. They like to go to her for obvious reasons. They feel like they can really relate and, and understand and etc. And she, likewise, feels a real calling to serve that population. Great. So, as a devout Muslim, she doesn't believe in abortion. She doesn't want to do it. Okay. So let's say this proposal goes through. The people who want to get rid of all conscience protections goes through. And they say to her, you know, I, tough luck. I, I, you know, you're, you don't want to do this, but sorry. You have to choose. Either do this or just get out of medicine. Okay. She's 53 years old. She's got three kids. Right? She's supporting all three of her kids herself. So not only is her economic well-being on the line, her family's economic being is on the line. And she has to choose. Right? Either you start doing abortions today or just get out of business, get out of medicine. You're 53 years old. Are you really going to be able to have a whole new career? You're going to go to law school or something? I mean, theoretically, I suppose you could, but it's going to be very hard, very hard at 53 to 
You've been a doctor for years and years and years, and you're going to all of a sudden reinvent yourself as a mechanic or a lawyer or whatever, right? So let's say she sticks with her convictions, and she says, all right, I'm a person of faith. I, I'm just not going to do that. I'm sorry. I guess if that's the law now, I have to do it. I'm just not going to do it. Well, what happens? Well, she loses her job, right? Her family is put in a very grave economic situation, right? Her three kids, who, know, who knows what they're going to do now? Her community, these Nigerian women who make a special effort to come see her because she understands them and they understand her, well, tough luck for them, right? They better just go. Uh, there's no other Nigerian Muslim doctor in the area, so tough, sorry. I guess you, you know, you're out of luck, right? Uh, I, I go see her too. I'm not a Nigerian woman, but I go see her too, and she helps me with my asthma medication and my whatever. I have to go find a new doctor. It's a big inconvenience for me. I've been seeing her for 10 years. I like her. She's great, right? And then does it even benefit the women who want to get abortions? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In Los Angeles, there are, I don't even know how many abortion clinics. I mean, for sure, 20, 30, for sure, and probably more than that. I mean, Los Angeles has a, a ton. I can think of three off the top of my head. I mean, it has a ton of them. So it's not even really helping women, because if they want to get an abortion in Los Angeles, you drive whatever, <laughs> you know, 10 minutes and you get to one. So this is a law, literally, that helps no one in this situation, right? including the women who want to get abortions, and harms very gravely the health care provider, her children, her community. And frankly, it may even hurt women who want to get abortions, because if they go to her, this uh, doctor, for their asthma medication and for their sinus infections and for whatever, all of a sudden she's out of business. So it may even harm them. This sort of proposal just doesn't make sense if you're thinking about the well-being of healthcare. And here's another consideration. As you probably know, Catholics provide about, or the, the church has hospitals that, that are about, it's about 17%, 18% of hospitals in the country are run by the church, right? And then how many physicians are practicing Catholics or persons of faith? I don't know exactly, but let's, Let's say, you know, there's lots of outside of Catholic healthcare. Like, I'll give you an example. My sister is a practicing physician in Seattle, right? So, what happens if they get their way, right? All physicians must do this. All hospitals must do this. All right. Some of these people are going to say, like my sister, I'm not doing that. I don't care what you say. I'm, I'm not doing that. And so, she'll have to get out of medicine, right? And Catholic hospitals, if they're forced to do abortions, they, they're going to say, we're just not doing that. I guess if, if, if you're making that the law and we have to do it to be hostile, we're just not going to do that. Now, what takes place in the healthcare system, right, if you got, you know, 20% or so less supply of healthcare and the demand is the same? What happens? You guys know your economics, right? The price of something is determined by what? Supply and demand, right? So if the supply of healthcare goes down 20% because all the Catholic healthcare is kicked out, all the Catholic Physicians and nurses are kicked out, and not just Catholics, of course. This is true for Muslims, true for many Protestants, true for many Jews, true for many secular people. So it may be higher than 20%. That may be a low ball. It might be 30, it might be 40. I don't know what the percent is. It might be big. But it's at least 20, I think, is very conservative. So let's say you get rid of 20% of healthcare in the United States. Just the per There's no provision of that. Is the demand for healthcare in the United States going down now? Right? It's just shrinking. Right? Is it? No, of course not. The demand for healthcare in the United States is going up, if anything. Right? You have all kinds of baby boomers who are, you know, getting older, and as they get older, obviously they have more health problems typically. And so the demand for healthcare in the United States is not going down, it's going up. So you have demand going up, you have supply going down. What's that going to do for the cost of healthcare? Shoot it up, way up. Way up. And is that, is that good news for everybody? Everybody who wants health care? Yeah, I want, I want my health care cost to double. Wonderful. Of course not. It's horrible news for everybody. For everybody. You're pro-choice. It's horrible news. You're pro-life. Pro, it's horrible news. If you're in the middle, it's horrible news. No one benefits, right, from skyrocketing health care costs, right? This harms literally everybody. So if you're thinking about the common good, right, you're thinking about, well, what is going to serve the common good? What, for instance, is going to serve the poor? You think about poor people. 
right? Maybe they don't have health insurance that's very good or any health insurance, right? And they're struggling now with their health care costs. Right now, it's very hard for them. Right now, they can hardly afford it. And you say to them, well, you know, I know you can barely afford it now, but you know what? We're going to increase it about 35% the first year. Might go up a little bit higher the second year. We'll see. I mean, that is unfair. That is unjust. And it damages the most vulnerable people in our society, these poor people who are already having trouble, right? Who are already suffering very much. So there are severe negative consequences for uh, abolishing these health care protections. And here's one more. Here's one more. Very negative consequence for everybody. Not just Catholics. It's not just, oh, it's Catholics want special rights. No, this affects everybody very negatively. Right now, medical schools admit people uh, without a discrimination against people of faith and against conscientious secular uh, people too. That, that, that doesn't factor in. So in other words, let's say you, you have nursing school applications, medical school applications, right? And let's say you get 100 of them or whatever, right? And they will take the top, let's say 25, okay? And, and, and again, there's no discrimination now, as things stand, against people of faith or secular conscientious objectors. But let's say the people that are making these arguments, they get their way, right? So now what happens? Well, those 25 people that got in, it turns out 10 of them are people that don't want to perform abortions, right? 10 of them. And they say, well, you know, that's really too bad. Uh, you're, you're not going to be able to go to medical school anymore, so you say goodbye to those 10 of the 25. Right? Then what happens? Well, you replace them with people who would have never gotten in otherwise. You get 10 people from the B team, right? The reject pool, who never would have gotten into medical school or nursing school, didn't have the, the sports for it. It's hard. Nursing is hard. Medicine is hard. This is not for dummies, right? So you get 10 of those people off the B team, the loser list. The, they got the rejection letter and say, aha, hey, come on in. Come on in. We got a place for you now, right? So the people that aren't that smart, aren't that driven, didn't really have the grades, didn't really get the good letters. They just are kind of the, you know, not that good. They didn't make it the first time. Well, now they're in. And now they're becoming nurses. And now they're becoming doctors. And then when you get cancer, you go to see the person from the B team that wouldn't have gotten in otherwise. You want that? You want your doctor to be the, from the B team? The nurse to be from the B team? That, that you think, do you want it? When my life's on the line, I want the best person possible. The best. And if it's an atheist, that's fine with me. If it's a Muslim, that's fine with me. If it's a Catholic, that's fine with me. When I get cancer, I want the A team. I want the A plus team, frankly. Right? And I do not want somebody else to say, well, the A plus doctor, the A plus nurse, sorry, she, she's not here because she had the wrong beliefs about, about controversial issues in our society. So we had to kick her out. Or we didn't admit her in the first place. That harms literally everyone. Literally everyone is harmed by that. Because we all want, of course we all want, the very best healthcare professionals we can get, right? Really smart, really competent, totally put together. It harms all of us to have people from the B team now all of a sudden on the A team. It harms all of us. Very serious. So here's another, here's another objection they raise. They say this, what we are denying is that professionals are entitled to subvert the objections of the professions they voluntarily joined by prioritizing their private beliefs over the professional delivery of services to the public, especially when they are, and this is important, monopoly purveyors of these services. Legal scholar uh, Alta Chero called it right when she said, claiming an unfettered right to personal autonomy while holding monopolistic control over a public good constitutes an abuse of the public trust. All the worse if it's not, in fact, a personal act of conscience, but rather an attempt at cultural conquest. So what is the idea? Let me put this, this argument in their own words. They say this. Whoever has a monopoly on providing legal medical services has an obligation to provide those legal medical services. Medical professionals have a monopoly on providing legal medical services. Therefore, medical professionals have an obligation to provide those legal medical services. So it's the argument for monopoly. Now, 
what's wrong with this argument? What's wrong with this argument? This argument is a great example of uh, an equivocal use of language. Right? An equivocal use of language. So what do I mean? Um, when it says that, uh, let's see here. When it says whoever has a monopoly, that's equivocal, right? So is it true that the medical profession as a whole has a monopoly on providing medical services? Well, yeah, that's probably true. But is it true that each individual nurse or doctor has a monopoly? That's not true. So what's at issue in conscience protection is not the entire healthcare profession doing whatever, because the entire healthcare profession doesn't have a conscientious objection, right? What we're talking about is an individual provider, an individual nurse, an individual doctor, an individual whoever, right? So when you break it down like that, the argument falls apart, right? Because individual healthcare providers do not have a monopoly. And so individual healthcare providers don't have an obligation to provide the service, right? So they're trading on an ambiguous, ambiguous uh, claim here. Here's another argument they make, and this is an argument uh, about religion. They say, for all practical intents and purposes, we are discussing predominantly religiously motivated conscientious objectors in the medical profession who ask that their objections to the delivery of particular medical services are protected by the secular state. In fact, they say, this is hard for me to believe, but they did say this, they said, um, we believe that, quote, the profession and society would likely be better off if such people chose not to join the profession. Hmm. That's interesting. So if you're a person of faith, you know, society would be a lot better off if these guys just didn't exist. Really? I mean, can you imagine saying this about any other group? I mean, really. Can you imagine someone in print saying, you know, healthcare profession would be better, you know, no Latinos in it no Asians in it, no any other group in it. I mean, people would go crazy. And why in the world do they think people of faith are going to be a detriment to the healthcare profession? I mean, if you're a Christian, right, what does that mean? Well, it seems to me it means that you're a follower of Jesus. You take Jesus' actions and teaching seriously, and you try, imperfectly of course, but you try to live out that in your own life, right? Now, how, if you were living out the life of Jesus as a healthcare professional, what would that mean? Well, one thing it would mean is that you'd be very humble, right? You would be someone who would be willing to admit imperfections, right? I mean, isn't part of following Jesus admitting that there's a distance between your ideal and your actual life? So, is a humble medical professional, is that a big problem? Is that, a, you know, we can't have any humility in the med medical profession? We can't have people admitting mistakes or trying to learn from their, you know, is that a problem? No. Well, how about this? Um, isn't it true that followers of Jesus are supposed to be truthful and honest, people of personal integrity? So you'd expect a Christian healthcare professional to tell the truth to patients, to fill out the truth on insurance forms, to be honest with other people, to act with personal integrity. Oh, that's, is that going to harm the healthcare profession? Can't have that. That's going to be a real detriment, right? Or horrible. If you're a Christian, aren't you called to love other people? Aren't you called to see in other people an image of God? Aren't you called, in fact, especially with vulnerable people, to treat them as Jesus in disguise? So what happens, what would happen if healthcare professionals did that? Right? What would happen if healthcare professionals treated patients that are vulnerable, patients that are suffering, treated them as if they were Jesus? And they showed the kind of kindness and care and concern that they would show if it really were Jesus who came in with a broken leg or whatever. Now, would that be a terrible thing? Right? I mean, would you want your nurse or doctor to treat you with that kind of respect? Or would that be horrible? Like, oh, we couldn't have that. No love. We can't have that. So the idea somehow that practicing Christians are going to corrupt medicine and make it horrible and, oh, it's going to be a catastrophe. Better off if all these terrible Christian people got out of medicine. Not only is it insulting, and frankly an expression I think of, of bigotry and discrimination, but it's completely untrue. It seems to me if you had a nurse or a doctor who is living out their Christian faith in a very robust and abundant way, that person would be spectacular. 
I mean spectacular as a healthcare professional. They would be so trusted by their patients. They would be not trusted, they would be loved by their patients. Their patients would want to see them. They'd be like, I can't wait to go talk to you know nurse so and so, doctor so and so, because when I talk to them, I feel the love. I feel their love. They are the best doctor, the best nurse I've ever met. They are terrific. And somehow these people should be kicked out of medicine? I, I honestly, I just, I literally don't understand how they can write this kind of thing. But here it is. This is a professional journal. I'm, I accurately, you know, I'm stating what they were saying. I think it's completely crazy, but that's what they're saying these days. The other thing about this, though, is even if, it, even if you did get rid of all people of faith, right, all Catholics, all Protestants, all Jews, all Muslims, kick them all out, is that really going to solve the problem? No, because there are secular people who have the same beliefs. A very famous case is a guy named Bernard Nathanson. He was an atheist who founded the National Abortion Rights Action League in the late 60s and didn't believe in God. But he came, even though he was for himself performed, I think it was 10,000 abortions, very many abortions, 65,000, a huge number, exactly. But he, as an atheist, came to believe that this was wrong. He saw ultrasound pictures and he thought, this, I, this, I can't do this anymore. Right? So why in the world should we have two sets of laws? Right? One for people of faith, and for those people we say, well, you can't practice medicine, get out of here. But Bernard Nathanson, when he, he did convert later, but before when he was an atheist, he said, well, since it's secular, oh, good, well, we'll protect you, we'll let you do this. I mean, that that's, doesn't make any sense at all. That's a double standard based on religious belief. That's problematic. So the fact is, there are secular people who have the same beliefs about, about this thing. And moreover, if we really did this, if we really kicked out Jews, Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, you know what else would happen? You would drive out of medicine a disproportionate number of women, a disproportionate number of Latinos, a disproportionate number of African Americans. Why? Because on average, women are more religious and spiritual than men, on average. On average, African Americans are more spiritual than white people, on average. On average, Latinos are more religious and spiritual than non-Latinos. So if you really pass their recommendation, well, get, let's get ready for the number of female doctors and nurses to go down. Let's get ready for the number of African American doctors and nurses to go down. Let's get ready for Latino doctors and nurses to go down. And is that what we want? We really desperately need a medical profession that's more white and more male? I mean. I, I can't see how that's a benefit, because isn't it a benefit to medicine? That there's diversity of perspective, diversity of race and gender, and some people like to see female physicians, right? Or male physicians or whatever. So they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be kicked out. Um, what other objections do they raise? Well, they say this. Just as we cannot test the plausibility of the ideological dicta that lead to conscientious objections, there's no test for the existence of God, for example. It's also impossible to ascertain whether conscientious objectors actually hold the views they profess to hold. Now, this objection is basically, look, you can't really prove, for instance, uh, in, a, in an empirical way, that abortion is wrong, right? And it is true. You can't go into a laboratory and turn on the Bunsen burner and mix up the chemicals and out pops abortions wrong. That's true. But the trouble is that same test also shows that you can't prove their views, right? In other words, what's the empirical justification for the views that they're defending? If you go into the lab and turn on the Bunsen burner and mix up the chemicals, does that pop, no one should have a right to conscientious objection somehow in the cloud? I mean, well, no, right? So they're holding people of faith to a standard that they themselves are not reaching, right? That's not consistent, right? That's not fair. All right. Um, one final uh, objection I want to talk about is the objection from inconsistency. And the objection from inconsistency is something uh, like this. Um, let's see. Okay, a, a female Muslim doctor refusing to see a male patient would not be granted a conscientious objection exemption. Whereas a pharmacist refusing to sell contraceptives in some countries might. So the idea is that we don't allow conscientious objection for everything, right? We wouldn't allow someone who says, well, I just don't, 
uh, you know, if I'm a doctor, say, or a nurse, I just don't treat, um, you know, Latinos or black people. I just don't do it. Like, we wouldn't allow that. So, therefore, they say there's an inconsistency because there's some kinds of conscientious objections we allow and some kinds of conscientious objections we don't allow. Right? So they say you're inconsistent. Either you allow everything or you allow nothing. That's the idea. Now, how would I respond to this? Why well, do I respond in two ways? First, there's an enormous difference between refusing to provide a particular treatment, on the one hand, and refusing to treat a particular kind of patient, on the other hand. Right? Those are two totally different things. Right? You can say, I don't do this treatment, abortion or whatever. And that's a different thing than saying, I don't treat this kind of patient, right? Women, black people, Latinos, or whatever, right? So that's a fundamental distinction. But another fundamental distinction, and maybe the, the more important distinction, is this. Conscientious objection can be consistently applied if we appeal to the goal of medicine, right? What is the goal of medicine? What's medicine aiming at? Well, it's not aiming at money. I mean, do some nurses and doctors work for money? Yes, they do. But that's not, that's an extrinsic goal, you might say, right? Um, is it prestige? Doctors and nurses have a lot of prestige. People really respect them. Yes, that's true. But the goal of prestige isn't the intrinsic goal of medicine. What is the intrinsic goal of medicine? What is medicine about, right? Well, medicine is about health, right? I mean, isn't the goal of medicine to restore health or protect health? It's, that's what it's about. Right? So, one way that we can differentiate legitimate conscientious objection from phony, illegitimate conscientious objection is with respect to health. Okay. So, if someone says, I don't perform this procedure or this treatment because it is against the good of health, that's one thing. Right? So, for instance, is pregnancy a disease? No. Pregnancy is not a disease. In fact, pregnancy is evidence of a healthy, proper functioning human body. It's not a disease. So to refuse to perform abortions is not acting against the good of health. Right? In fact, it's in accordance with the good of health, the health of the, the prenatal human being and the health of the mother too. On the other hand, if a nurse or doctor says, well, I just don't treat uh, Latinos or African Americans or whatever, is that related to the good of health? No, that's just totally extraneous to the good of health. So we can use the good of health objectively understood to differentiate legitimate conscientious objection, like I don't give abortion, say, from illegitimate, I just don't treat black people, say. Those are two different things. Now, some people would say, well, isn't health merely subjective? Right? Health is whatever you say it is. But I would disagree with that too. Right? Health is not merely subjective. It's not, health is not about giving the patient whatever the patient happens to want. And why is it not that? Well, if, if health, if, if medicine really were just giving the patient whatever the patient wanted, well, then you'd come to absurd conclusions. I mean, imagine um, a young woman comes in with anorexia and comes to the doctor and says, I'm really concerned about my weight. And they're like, well, um, you know, like you weigh like 90 pounds. Uh, I think you're totally fine. You, in fact, you're underweight. No, 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 I'm totally obese. I need, you know, gastric surgery or whatever it is where they tie it off. I mean, now a doctor would say, no, I'm not doing that, right? Because you say, no, you feel like you're unhealthy, but in fact, right, you're not obese, you're not overweight, and in fact, you don't need the gastric bypass, you know, surgery at all, and I'm not doing it, right? Because it, 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 it just goes against your health, right? So we can't make medicine simply providing whatever the patient wants unless we're going to completely corrupt the goods that are interior to medicine, the, the goal of medicine. Because if, if medicine turns out to be, well, just deliver the patient whatever the patient wants, well, then, again, patients could come and say, oh, I want some drugs for this weekend. I'm having a, having a party. You know, I'm turning 16. I thought it would be really fun to have some, some you know, quaaludes or whatever. So give me a prescription, and I'll give it to my friends. I mean, cr obviously we can't do that. That's, that's crazy. That's not medicine. That's drug dealing. Right? Medicine is an art aimed at a goal. The goal is health, restoration of proper bodily function. The goal is not... Whatever it is you want, I'm going to give you. Right? That's, that's a drug dealer. <laughs> that's a totally different thing. Okay. So what I've done in this lecture is I've tried to at least look at some of the prominent reasons given in academic bioethics for abolishing conscience protection. 
And the reason I've talked about these things is I think this is a very important issue for people of faith and also for people without faith. Because if these people succeed in getting rid of protections of conscience, that is going to affect not just Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, secular people that don't want to do whatever. It's going to affect literally everyone in the country and affect them adversely. Both the expense of health care will be driven up, and because the 18 people are not going to be providing the health care in some cases, the quality of health care is going to go down for everybody. And that is a very serious problem. Thank you very much.